All right. uh, hey, we are live. <laughs> we, I couldn't hear anything from the intro. There's a, uh, welcome to the Atheist Experience. Uh, today is Sunday, February 26th, 2017. I'm your host, Matt Dillon. Joining me this week, Teresa Harris. Hey. Yay. How are you? Good. Doing all right. I have a, 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 an important correction to make from something that was said on last week's show, a couple of quick announcements, and then we're pretty much going to get to calls. Uh, first of all, apologies if anybody, I don't, it doesn't appear that anybody got dropped, but we had an internet reset here just before we went live. It looks like everything's back to normal. We'll find out when we get to the first caller. Uh, but I wanted to start off with a correction. Last week, during a phone call, somebody had brought up uh, whether or not something was the null hypothesis, and I went off on a little rant that the null hypothesis uh, by definition can't be falsified. I don't know why my brain did that. I, I Trust me, I do. Ha not only do I have an understanding of the null hypothesis, but I've lectured on it, and I used it extensively in the debate that I did uh, yesterday against Mike Lacona. Uh, but some people emailed in and said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I don't know what's wrong with me. The truth is the null <laughs> hypothesis in inferential statistics is essentially not something that can't be falsified, but something that can't be proven. Falsifying the null hypothesis is exactly how we go about establishing that a new hypothesis is more likely correct. So the null hypothesis is the idea that there's no connection between two things. Null hypothesis is there's no connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer. And that becomes the de facto stance until such time as there's evidence that there is a connection between the two. Um, it's, how, it, it's how you establish kind of a burden of proof. It is the thing that you are arguing against. And so you could say, the null hypothesis is that there's nobody who was alive during the War of 1812 who is alive now. Now, you can't prove that, just as a matter of practical impossibility, uh, but you could demonstrate that it's false by, you know, hey, here's somebody, and we, look, we've got all these pictures and documents, their history, and they've survived this. Uh, we could at least in, hypothetically uh, demonstrate that there was somebody alive. And just because your ancient book says that people lived to 600, 700, 800, 900 plus years doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's plausible to conclude that somebody who was alive during the War of 1812 is alive now. <laughs> You've got to come with more than that. So that's the, the correction. Uh, by the way, the debate that I did yesterday was uh, Texas Baptist uh, or Texas Apologetics did the Unapologetic Conference at Austin Baptist Church. Uh, it was great. I, I had a good time. I met uh, Lee Strobel and Mark Mittenberg and debated Mike Lacona, um, also Braxton. I'm sorry, Braxton, I've forgotten your last name, but he gave a talk on apologetics. Uh, it was interesting. It was a good opportunity to be standing in a Baptist church and talking to the people who I think perhaps uh, might have a little more to, to gain from understanding why I don't believe anymore. Uh, and interesting, well, a number of interesting things happened. I'm not going to, the debate's available at Austin Baptist Church. I'm going to be posting my own copy of the debate um, by probably around the end of March. I, I'm going to give them a month so that they can direct traffic since they're the ones that paid for all of this. Um, one thing that happened is some people that I had not seen in 30 years, three of them, flew down from St. Louis, Missouri, just because well, th these are people who went to church with me, uh, the parents of one of my best friends and another member of the church, who saw in their newsletters about apologetics that I would be debating at this conference. They flew down from St. Louis to, to attend this conference. It was really nice to see them after 30 years. We didn't get to talk a lot because they had to leave quickly. Uh, but one of them got up during the Q&A to essentially say, what happened? You know, we knew you when you were a teenager, you were active in our church. We viewed you as one of the rising potential stars here. We expected great things from you. What happened? How did you get from there to here? And I won't go into it all here, but in the debate or in the, towards the end of the Q&A session, uh, I got to go into it in great detail. And it was clear that he was a little broken up and disturbed, as, as I would expect people to be. You know, we... We were around you all this time. We figured you were going to be this great, you know, warrior for Christ, and now the exact opposite has happened. Um, and, and it's difficult, and it was difficult for me, but I think it was perhaps um, the best moment from the debate. And it had nothing to do with the debate, but it, it allowed everybody there to connect for them to realize, oh, yeah, hey, he was actually one of us. This isn't just, you know, oh, I used to be a Southern Baptist and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was, it was really... Uh, is significant, and I'm thrilled that they were there, and it was good to catch up with them briefly um, after 30 years. Wow. It's, there's uh, strange curves that get thrown to me all the time. It's a trip, man. Uh, just <laughs> not, not that we're going to use the show to give everybody my entire schedule all the time, but there's a couple events that I wanted to mention. 
uh, and that is uh, the weekend of March, oops, I fast forward, the weekend of March 18th in Nashville, the Nashville Nuns Convention, NanoCon, is going to be happening. I'll be there uh, to give a keynote, but also a debate workshop that I'm doing with JT Everhard. And at the end of April, the final weekend in April, the 29th, I'll be in Detroit. Uh, they sent me a, uh, a link to a Facebook page, which unfortunately, after we lost the internet, my phone reset and I don't have it right now. But the Detroit Coalition of Reason, uh, Michigan Atheists are putting on a convention uh, at the end of April. I will be there to speak for that. You can search around on Facebook and Google and stuff like that. Very cool. What have you got? Nothing, man. I got nothing. Wow, that must be nice. <laughs> I, I got home yesterday, and I'd been basically at this Baptist. I spent more time in a Baptist church this weekend than I have in probably 10 years. Because uh, oh, nice. I'll go to churches on occasion, but it's just like, let me go to a service. Whereas this weekend, I was there from 3 o'clock Friday afternoon pretty much till, you know, 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock last night. Or no, yeah. it was 5. Anyway. Uh, it, it was fun. It was interesting. I didn't catch fire when I walked in. Uh, it did feel a little like old home, but in a, like it's like if you came home wearing a really bad haircut and nobody had seen you in a while. That's kind of how how it felt. Huh. It's like you walk in and they think they recognize you, but <laughs> there's what did you do to yourself type of thing. Uh, but it was everybody was really nice. We had a good time. Uh, there was one thing, and I don't know if I'll mention this in the rebuttal, but there was one thing that. Mike Lacona had said during the debate, uh, the debate was on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And the short version is, Mike's argument is, there's evidence in reality uh, to suggest that reality can, includes a supernatural dimension. And so he spent a good bit of his opening talking about ghost stories and apparitions and near-death experiences and what seems to be events that are just couldn't be coincidences and therefore they're answered prayer. Uh, use all that to kind of serve as a foundation for the idea that we're reasonable in concluding that there's a supernatural realm. And then the second part was evidence suggests that Jesus rose from the dead. Now the first part's completely irrelevant. The subject of the debate was his entire second part. Uh, and I got examples from people when I, we were talking about supernatural. Uh, Mike said, you know, if, if, if a terrorist came in and lopped my head off right here in the middle of this room, and then an hour later I walked out into the green room uh, completely alive with a scar and told you that I had a message for you from somebody who had passed on and it was about a conversation that only the two of you knew about, would you then believe that this was supernatural? And I said, no. What I would believe is that this actually occurred and that I don't have an explanation for it. If you're going to say that the supernatural is the explanation for this event, you have to be able to define the supernatural, show that it's real. All I know at that point is that I'm willing to accept this happened. I saw you die. You are now back. So I would accept that Mike, in that circumstance, was raised from the dead or rose from the dead. The how behind it is a different story. Right. And we don't just get to appeal to the supernatural. And he was just absolutely flummoxed that this wouldn't be enough to convince me of the supernatural. And it turns out that, as far as we can tell, <laughs> the supernatural is a bucket in which we put all the things we can't explain. So wait a minute. Boom. 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 Was the assumption that you've never heard of people's claims about ghosts? or I mean, I, how could you think someone wouldn't have already been aware of these things? And they still hold the position that they hold. So to think that reminding them that people tell ghost stories or people say certain things. I think it was a way of just, let me put in all these things that we don't have explanations for, yeah. claim they're supernatural. And then as soon as I've claimed that they're supernatural, now all of a sudden a resurrection seems more plausible because you well, already I get accept their, it. I get the strategy. What I'm trying to figure out is if they're saying it to you, is, wouldn't the assumption kind of be that you're not aware of all this stuff already? Because, I mean, you're kind of rejecting it. That's why you're there. And so for somebody to say, well, here, let me tell you about this ghost story, and let me tell you about this psychic that I went to see, and let me tell you. And it's like people are telling you all these stories, and it's like you don't think that I've ever heard of a psychic, or I don't what, have an what, idea What they about. think is, what they think, and they're correct, is that I don't have an explanation for those, but they think that they do. But do they think that that not having an explanation is going to convince you 
that the supernatural is involved when you're sitting there and you already know these stories and you're not convinced? Like, do they think that telling no, you the stories again No, he's not trying is, to convince me. He's just, but he's using he's it in the debate. Yes, because he wants to show the audience that I'm unreasonable, that anybody should accept the supernatural is true based on this, and Matt won't. But it's almost as though you come into the debate loaded with this and you've never even looked up a skeptical response. I oh, mean, no. Well, the, the people in the audience, so here's the thing. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do the, the whole like debate review thing here. Here's the thing. The people sitting in the audience there have never looked up a skeptical response. The people sitting in the audience there, uh, both Sunday night and uh, Monday, or Saturday, Friday night and Saturday during the thing, on two different occasions, somebody asked people to raise their hand if they'd heard of Bill Craig, William Lane Craig. Almost no hands went up. This is a church full of people, and they are mentioning the foremost Christian apologist. And I mentioned to a friend of mine who's an apologist who is there, we're living in a bubble. We're assuming, mm -hmm. the people in the pews don't care about apologists. <laughs> right. They don't care about apologetics. Right. God is clearly real. Jesus is clearly real. Jesus loves them. They're going to heaven. That's it. Why would they care about teleological arguments and ontological arguments and all these? So they don't, they don't even know who Craig is. They, they are more concerned with the evangelical side than the apologetics side. And I just did a video kind of drawing a distinction between the two. So this whole thing was about a disagreement about how the... I still wonder, it almost seems though, if you were going to debate someone who's a skeptic, I mean, he's addressing, I understand you're, you've got an audience, but he's addressing you and your arguments. That's the whole point is the two of you are putting your... No, he's presenting his best case. He's not addressing right. my thing. But I mean, the best case should include and... This is what the skeptics will say, and oh, this is no. why that's not correct, or this is why I disagree with that. I mean, oh, you, you would you would think that that would come up. In if a... you were going to debate a person, wouldn't the first thing you would do would be to look up their responses to the things that you think are difficult to respond to? You would want to see what they said about it. That's what I do. That's not what apologists <laughs> yeah, do, I mean, because apologists who, who are familiar with this just say, "Oh, you're you're being unreasonable. How could you not?" Hey, look. <laughs> Our church needed $7,412. We held a prayer meeting all night, and the next day a check showed up from someone who had started an account years ago, let it accrue, and sent us the check without even knowing we needed it, and that check was for exactly $7,412. How can you not conclude that this is God intervening? And uh, my answer is, I don't believe the story. First of all, you have to prevent, present more evidence than just, hey, I know this person, and this is... Because I also know that people... Uh, What's the thing? Exa fudge. Exaggerate <laughs> that stories become more impressive. It's a fish tale. Yeah. I, show me that they needed exactly seven thousand four hundred twelve dollars, and that the next day somebody a check arrived from somebody who didn't know this, and then now we have hey, this is a, an incredible coincidence. Now please demonstrate that it's an impossible occurrence without the invention of the supernatural. But you also have to define supernatural. Well, and I think sometimes people need to ask themselves. I mean. That's what a coincidence is, right? It's like two events that are that happen closely in time that are meaningfully connected to the person who's assessing the events, right? I mean, that's yeah. what a coincidence is. So in other words, two events that happen close in time that you don't have a meaningful connection to, like I went to the store today and then two hours later I went and got my hair done. Whoa, you know, it's like, how is that even, you wouldn't call it a coincidence because there's no meaningful connection between the two. And it also has to be a causal, right? Like you have to not, so in other words, if, if you went to the store and you uh, bought a trout because it was on sale at HEB and Beth went to another HEB and she bought a trout because she saw it on sale and you guys come home and you're like, what a coincidence, we both bought trout. I says, no, it's not a coincidence, it was on sale and you both saw it, you like trout. I mean, so a coincidence has to be something where it's like you would not, there, where you're assuming there's no causal connection where right. you see that, that there's some meaningful connection in your own mind or that you would think would be a reasonable persons, you know, right. would meaningfully connect the events. And they have to be close enough in time to make it like, ooh, this happened and then this happened. Yeah, this is where we got to... <laughs> that's a coincidence. I mean, that's what a coincidence is. Supernatural is a bucket where you put all the things that you can't <laughs> explain in and then you pretend like you've explained them. Because despite, this was a point of contention as well, the supernatural has no explanatory power. We explain things, no, we explain the unknown in terms of the known. That's how we gain a better understanding. And the supernatural is just exp trying to explain a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. Right, right. That's like old stuff for the show. Yeah. It, and uh, and, it, and it was new stuff for them. But also he said, the one thing he said was when he went after methodological naturalism, uh, talking about how, oh, it's, it's a bankrupt uh, position, uh, 
it, first of all, it's the foundation of science, and I defended all of this, but he's like, if a comet smashed into the, to the moon and it spelled out in letters, you know, I am the Lord your God in Greek and Aramaic and everything, he claimed that scientists, because of methodological naturalism, would be prohibited from even acknowledging that the event occurred. That is not only false, I have a hard time believing somebody with his education isn't aware that this is false. Of course the scientists would be able to acknowledge that this happened. They would then be able to potentially investigate it. And, in, and until they found out what the explanation was, the scientists would say, we have no explanation. And it may be that way forever. We have no explanation. But he spun this in a different direction and tried to claim that methodological naturalism is a safe space for skeptics who are triggered by spirituality. And that's when I lost my shit. Uh, I sat there as calm as I could, and we addressed you know, science in a respectful fashion. But he went from, this philosophical idea is bankrupt, to let me just snark at it in terms of some other things that I, I think are silly or reject. His, his complete attitude changed during that sentence or so. And I, I like Mike, we got along, you know, we, we both have an interest in magic. I'd be happy to debate him again, but I hope he goes back and watches that debate to see just how snarky and dismissive that particular thing was when the truth is, all methodological naturalism says is, until such time as we have a demonstration that the supernatural exists and is real and can act in a causal fashion to reality, we cannot be justified in appealing to it as an explanation. That's it. As soon as somebody demonstrates that the supernatural is real, all of a sudden it becomes a possible explanation that gets rolled into uh, scientific method. We're just not there. We may never be there. That's not the fault of science. That's the fault of the people who are attributing, you know, supernatural causation. We actually have a couple calls on, on I guess, yeah, for this let's subject. Do it. So we've got uh, Keith in Ohio who supposedly has evidence for the supernatural. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We yeah, can. Yeah, we can. Thanks for calling. Oh, you have no idea how honored I am. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a truck driver from Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, so and I'm in Ohio. So, and I want to actually drive down to you guys to watch your show and sit in. Um, I'd love that, but, and go out to you guys real fast. Okay. So I was wondering, uh, the word hypothetical raises red flags with you guys. Um, but well, I, I, which, no, I have no problem. I have no problem with hypotheses. Okay, cool. Now, real fast. Uh, I, now, if you guys were, this is having to do with paranormal, okay? So if you were in a supposed open field during the daytime with five other people with you, uh, maybe ha all of you are atheists, and this supposedly is a haunted place. There isn't any twigs or anything. You all had shirts on, and you were standing five feet apart from each other. Now, all of a sudden, randomly, if you guys got scratch marks underneath your shirts on your back on the same handprint, would you, what would you, I, I was actually kicked out of the ACS experience, whatever, on Facebook. Nothing with you guys. They thought I was a troll. But asking that question, and the answer was, I, I from some people, it was a legitimate question, but others, it was, uh, I can't explain it. Uh, I don't know, but if that happened to you guys on a personal way, um, what would you suppose or your idea or – and also on the side note, I would recommend if you guys, of course, don't believe in the supernatural, spend the night at a place that is supposed to be haunted or I've already done yourself, that. But, uh, okay, I, I, that's cool. I like that. Now – what would happen in the scenario of the hypothetical situation I described? I tell you what, what I, answer, you I answered all this over and over yesterday, so I'll, I'm going to let Tracy just knock it out of the park real quick. I'm not sure what you mean by, I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking me. I, I'm trying to figure Scratched. out. Yeah, no, no, I understand what the, the scenario you're describing, but what is it that, you, that you're asking from me? Uh, would you think that would be a supernatural thing that would I, happen? I wouldn't, think, I wouldn't think anything of it. I wouldn't think anything of it. I wouldn't know what to think about it. Why would I think anything when I don't know what caused it? Well, if it was a uh, supposed place, if this happened, and people don't have any idea what happened, but if it happened to you personally, 
you you would basically say, oh, I don't know, I just got scratched underneath my shirt and no one touched it and everyone had the same marks on their back. We don't understand. Would right, that that's be... what you just described and that would be my assessment of what happened. And last question, what would it take or what would, I know this Hebrew stuff, whatever in the sky, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't agree with, I, that wouldn't even convince me there's a God personally or whatever, but what would it take for you guys to um, uh, believe in the supernatural, or have you ever had any experiences of your own where there was a possibility? No, or what would it take for you guys to... I think what you're asking me is what would it take for me to be convinced that there's a supernatural dimension to reality? Is that the question? Yes, and... And uh, have you had anything happen that you could have possibly uh, thought might have been like uh, after somebody died, you woke up at a certain time or had a scent or uh, well, keys were uh, okay. moved or something? In the past, when I was a kid, for example, um, I had all kinds of superstitious ideas about the world. So there was a time in my life when I did subscribe to a lot of superstition. I don't anymore. And I think since becoming a skeptic, I have not had an experience that has made me question um, whether or not it had a supernatural explanation, because I don't know what a supernatural explanation even looks like. And that's the problem. So, well, okay. this is the problem. Like what you described in the field, right? You're saying, yeah. you know, would that, would that be convincing, uh, a convincing scenario for the supernatural? And I guess my question is, why would I assume the supernatural manifests that way? Like, what, what is it about the event that you think You'd have to know something about the supernatural and how it functions and how it manifests before you could look at the result and say, that's the supernatural. It's almost like saying, did something get burned, right? We know, we know a lot of times what something looks like if it's been burned. Like when I bought my house, one of my cabinets has a burn mark on the, you know, so clearly someone had a fire in the kitchen because I've got a cabinet that's burned. Uh -huh. And we yep. recognize that. Now, what if I'd never seen anything burned ever? Why would I think, why would I have an idea about what caused it if I've never seen anything burned? The reason that I have an idea about what might have happened to the cabinet is because I understand how a burn looks. And so my assumption, and I could be wrong, but my assumption in looking at it is this looks very much like, like what a burn looks like, what fire does to a cabinet. But if I've never seen fire do anything, or if I don't have, if I've never been able to examine fire and the results of fire, how would I know what the manifestation of the result of a fire would, would appear to be. So what you're saying is because you don't even uh, know, let's say, like fire, you, you wouldn't even know what fire was, <laughs> right. therefore you wouldn't even know what to call it. Right, why would so I start saying, hey, fire did this? And it's like, well, what is fire? You've never, you don't know what fire <laughs> is. You've never seen it. You've never examined it. You're, you're using this word that doesn't even mean anything. And... I mean, it, it literally has no meaning until there's something there to, to examine. Now, you can examine the evidence of something done underneath five of your shirts simultaneously. Yeah, you can see a scratch. Scratched. Right, yeah, you can but see that people are scratched. That if, if I don't know, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like asking what caused the cabinet to look that way if somebody's never seen a fire. Or something to be thrown across the room. You, so basically you're saying there's nothing that you would... Uh, uh, believe to that to, that the supernatural exists because there is no foundation. Of, well, what I'm saying what is is that like if we did or... some investigation of the the flying objects, or we could do further investigations of the scratch marks Scratching. and how they appear, and we could get some if there were some way to get gather evidence for a cause. What you've got is is the event. This is like what Matt was saying about the moon. You've got the event, and yeah, you can look at the event, but we know what scratches look like, and we're saying, okay, these appear to be scratches, but what caused them? I mean, even in your story, if you're saying it's a supernatural attribution, what does that mean? How did the scratches, Matt, like how did the, we get scratches on us? You're saying, well, it could be supernatural. Well, supernatural how? How did the supernatural yeah. scratch us? It, it, really, it really doesn't. Uh, whether maybe don't even call it the supernatural, but something invisible or something visible just happened to cross. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Sure. Keith, 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 stop. Yep, Matt, go ahead. Isn't everything either visible or not visible? You just said either the invisible or the visible did something. Doesn't that include everything? But you don't believe invisible. Yeah. 
invisible Keith, item. Keith, Keith, your Go argument ahead. is that one item in a set of all items did something. That tells us nothing. So one, meaning invisible, would have caused that. Every, everything's either, everything is either visible or not visible, correct? Yes, and that would so, be a no, non-visible. Uh, stop. So when you said that the scratch was caused by something visible or caused by something invisible, what you're saying is the scratch was caused by something and it could be anything. It, correct. Then how do you reach a but, conclusion about what it was? Well, because all five eyes saw that no one was behind them it doesn't and something matter. caused it, so uh, you don't okay, know so what you, it was. Okay, you, so you haven't even ruled out the visible there yet. All you've ruled out is whether or not somebody saw it. The, uh, there are things in the other room that are visible that I can't actually see right now, right? Correct. So your first step is you haven't even ruled out things visible. You've just ruled out whether or not it was seen. My question is, uh, how do you determine what the cause of those scratches were? You would determine what what the well. It's not possible. Okay. To determine okay. What the scratches Keith, were Keith, from? Keith. <laughs> then how is your example in any way relevant to whether or not someone accepts supernatural explanation? Can you repeat it one last time? I promise. How? How is your example I, uh -huh. in any way relevant? to whether or not someone should accept supernatural explanations. Because there's a possibility of it being that. How do you know that? From, from, well, okay, first of all, actually, before you even answer that question, no. Uh, you, just, you just acknowledge there's no way to tell. And yet your example, your example implies that one could be reasonable in in accepting a supernatural explanation for those scratches when you just acknowledge that there's no way to tell. If there's no way to tell, how could you possibly reach the, ex the, the conclusion that the supernatural is the best explanation for that? What is, is a possibility okay? Does that pass in your books that it how could do you, be a possibility? Okay, just for, a here's, 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 here's the problem which Tracy tried to exist, uh, Tracy tried to address. If you don't know anything about fire and you've never had an example of fire, there's no reason uh -huh. to conclude that fire is possible or a likely explanation. First, you need a definition and understanding of fire and then an understanding of what fire can do. How, you, you can't even say that the supernatural is possible. You haven't demonstrated that. You haven't defined what supernatural is. You haven't demonstrated that it's possible. And how could it then be a, a possible explanation until you've done that? Well, because it also can't be impossible either. How do you right? know that? Like, how do you know that? No, because all we know is the scratch marks underneath the shirt. Right, that that's all we know. Scratch marks yeah. are irrelevant. Scratch marks are irrelevant to the question of whether or not the supernatural is real and, ha and can be used as an explanation. You say the supernatural is possible, and I said, right. how do you know the supernatural is possible? And you said, because it can't be impossible. How do you know that? Well, because of what happened about... No. I, I keep on going back to the scratch marks. So I know, and that's the problem. That's the, pro the, that's the problem. Go you keep going back to something that cannot possibly demonstrate and is irrelevant to the question. The supernatural... We'll, we'll set aside how we define it for a second. The supernatural is either possible or impossible. You think it's possible, and when I asked why, you said because it can't be impossible. And I asked, how did you determine that the supernatural cannot be impossible? Yes, but you're you're cream you're kicking my ass with logic. Yes, I understand. It's, I, it's fine. You're cool. No, I, but, all, but, all I want is for you to answer the question. You think that something is plausible. You think that something is possible, and your reason for thinking that it's possible is because you claim it can't be impossible. Now, if you can demonstrate successfully that it cannot be impossible then I would accept that, that it's possible. possible. But you haven't but done that. A, but, but nothing is 100% all the time uh, uh, without evidence. I, like, don't, I so, don't even know what that sentence had to do with what we were talking no, about. I'm not sure what it meant. 
No, but but the thing is, I I just don't. The bottom line is, what would it take for you guys to? No, no, Keith. Type of evidence? Keith, the bottom, the bottom line is this. The answer to your question is, what would it take to convince us that the supernatural is real? It would start with a logically sound argument supported by evidence that, in fact, the supernatural is real, has been defined. It simply is not going to convince us to say, well, it can't be impossible. And then when I ask, how do you know it can't be impossible? You flounder around and say things that don't even make sense. How do you know that the supernatural is possible? What way can you measure it? Because it's in, it's hard to measure. I, I would I would say, as far as I can tell, we don't have any way to measure. Not that it's hard to measure. What would we even it's, be measuring? It's we don't difficult even know to measure the volume measure. of the lake, you know, behind my house. If if all you've got is a tablespoon, uh, but I mean, I don't even see a lake here. Invisible causing something that we don't know what's causing it. Like we don't know what's causing it. On the wall. And if you don't yeah, know what's like, causing it, you can't then you don't know if it's a supernatural cause. And when you say that it could be, the question is, how do you even know it could be? Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. I just, uh, I just wouldn't, if I was in the shoes of being out in the field there, I, I am a, I, I would be skeptical too, but I would, I, you would go <laughs> home saying, All right. I want evidence. <laughs> I would go home saying, it, I think it's... Please uh, come in from absolutely. the field. I, I have a question, Keith, though. come Keith. in from the field right, and address Keith. the issue. Yeah, you're in the, you're in the field, and this Hold happens to you. I'm just curious. What is your explanation for what just happened? Well, I, I, I am more of a... Um, uh, trust me, I, I'm not the typical... But something invisible would have caused that that I can't explain, of course. Of course, like, you guys are looking for the explanation. I would... We tend to believe it would be something supernatural, but you guys like what? Would say, well, I still like need what? proof. Like what? Like an invisible entity. Like what kind of entity? That, so now we've got, now it's invisible and it's an entity. What are you calling an entity? Uh, something that did something that you can't see uh, physically with your eyes. But that's bacteria. That, okay, that's large. That, somebody that passed on. But, but the thing is, you can't prove that. I'm but asking why saying, you I would can't. even assume it. Like, why would you even start making, why would you head, look at the path you're heading down and, the, and the, the pieces that you're putting in place based on a situation where you have no explanation at all and no, no investigation to determine what has happened. And you're already building this model of a thing that's got like parts and pieces. And from what? There, there, are, well, there are, Keith, hang on. There are five people standing out in your field. Person, yep. person one, after this happens, a says... A haunted field. A haunted field. Okay. Does it matter? I mean, what is no, haunted? No, no, it does matter. No, it does matter, Keith. You don't just get to call it a haunted field. You have to demonstrate it's haunted. But, okay, okay. Let, let's assume okay. that we've called it a haunted field. Can I finish my thought? Yeah, sorry. There are five people standing in the field, and they end up with these scratches on their back. Person one says, I don't have an explanation for why there are scratches on my back. Yep. Person two says, I believe that it was, you know, maybe some bacteria or fungus or something like that, even though I don't have evidence for it yet. Person yep. three says, I'm convinced that it was some sort of supernatural agent. Person four is convinced that it was an alien death ray and per that didn't kill him. And person five says it was God Almighty who reached down from the heavens and, and anointed us with a birthmark or a, a, a new a second birthmark. Which one, of those, yeah. which one of those five people has the most reasonable, most defensible position? That was, wow, I'm very impressed, uh, Matt. Uh, that was a great example. I, you know what? None of them have any evidence. Bullshit. Well, well, all right. They all have the same evidence. They have the same evidence. Right. Okay. But as far as uh, what caused it, they don't have any. So who's the most reasonable person of those five? Can that be subjective? Do, do, or do, do, do. I don't. I'll you know, give you like, a hint. What <laughs> <laughs> the person who says they don't know what happened. Right. That's the person that's, that's most reasonable because they're recognizing okay. that they don't have sufficient evidence to reach a conclusion. That person is acknowledging that I don't have enough evidence to reach one of those other conclusions or any other proposed conclusions. So for now, I'm going to say I don't know because that's honest and accurate. Yep. 
and let's wait till we have information that yep. helps us okay. determine a cause. Now, now that we've excluded person number one, which of the remaining four is most reasonable? Uh, well, out of the three, four left, uh, number two. The, the, the one that is appealing to natural causes about things that we know, because we know that just not seeing something, it okay. still could be something like a bacteria or something like that, right? Okay, so now we've, uh. now we've eliminated two people who, as the most reasonable. The three, left? the three left, <laughs> who is the most unreasonable of all? Well, of course, you know, I know where you're going the third one. No, yeah. no, the most unreasonable of all is the God one at the end. So w what they've done is they've added a whole bunch of specifics. The third one just says, hey, there's something supernatural. The second one, so you're well, actually, probably the fourth one would, would be because alien, alien death ray, you know, whatever. But the, the point is, by Occam's razor, the more that you add to this that you don't have justification for, the further you depart from having a reasonable stat standing. Yeah, I, you know what? I just have to say the psychological reason why people, I think, believe that is because of the way they were raised and what they have experienced in the past or have seen on TV or whatever. And so they jump to conclusions to uh, put pieces together, how they think based off their experiences without having... Um, I agree that cultural experiences know, will will push you toward then, particular explanations, especially for things you don't understand. There so, are certainly situations where I, I, there's like a really good story called Shakespeare in the Bush, and there's an example where somebody is talking about a, the, a ghost in the story of Hamlet, right? And they say that Hamlet's father, he sees his dead father's ghost. And they start to explain it, and they're explaining the story to a group of people who live in a culture where ghosts um, are not understood. So they have no cultural context for ghosts. And so what they do is they say, no, it couldn't be this thing that you're saying. Dead people don't communicate. Like a dead person doesn't communicate. They said it, it must be like a, a, some sort of a specter that was put into Hamlet's head by a witch because they had a cultural context for that. So for them, when you see dead people, it means that there's a witch that is manipulating your mind to make you see this thing, and it's probably very evil, and you shouldn't trust it, which kind of blows the story of Hamlet, because the whole idea is that it was his ghost father trying to tell him about the murder. So in the situation where a person's trying to tell the story of Hamlet, they're using a cultural context where ghosts uh, can, can appear, and especially come forward if they had a bad death and they're trying to get help. But in the context of the people that were hearing the story, there's no such thing as a ghost, and, but there are witches, and they can make you see things. And so they determined that, in the, you know, that the story is actually describing a specter sent by a witch. So, so, yeah. so last, last question, Keith, and then I'm going to move on to other callers. Now that we've established okay. that the most reasonable answer is I don't know, if you were to be out in that field now, would you still conclude that it was likely a supernatural entity? I would have to say, uh, thinking through, if you were by me and explained it the way you did. What I difference does it make if I'm in the field? You, you keep going well, to things that have no bearing on the question. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not disagreeing with you. Actually, I would base, because of you explaining to me those five situations, if uh, whatever, I, uh, I would actually be able to say, I don't know. Cool. Would be... The, the right thing to say out of my mouth. You are getting a round of applause no. right now from everybody <laughs> on the are. other side of the glass. You are. All how, right. how come? How come? Because they, they are happy that you understand the point. I mean, and, and I don't say yeah, that. I, that's not I a facetious wrong. thing. Well, anybody, you know, I guess could be wrong. But. So, so I lied about that being the last question. Be because you got that answer. Let me, let me ask you this. Is something possible just because it hasn't been shown to be impossible? Is something possible just because it hasn't shown to be not possible? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anything is no. possible. No. No, no, not anything. I have to be careful not to words with you because you're the best at. So th this is. Go ahead. Let's let's try this again real quickly. Okay. Okay. We have a claim. Is it possible that this claim is true, merely and only? because it hasn't been demonstrated that it's not true. It is possible. No. Because it hasn't been demonstrated. Okay, has it been demonstrated 
that I can flap my wings and fly like a bird? No, it hasn't. Has it been demonstrated that this is impossible? Oh, yeah, with what you're saying, yes. No. It has been demonstrated. When, when, ha when, when you have wait, Keith, Keith, when has it been, dem when was it demonstrated that it is impossible for me to flap my wings and fly? When has it, when is it, ah, uh, it, you have never flapped your wings and fly. How do you know so that? Is, How do you know that? And just because I haven't done it, does that mean it's impossible? Well, here's a better way no. to, wait, can I try this, Keith? Oh, Let, wait, I, I, no. I'd like to try this. Okay. Is something cold just because it hasn't been demonstrated to be hot? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So something if something hasn't been demonstrated, we were so close. Well, here's, well, here's what here's what Matt's trying to get we you were to understand. So close. Well, here's yeah. what Matt's trying to get you to understand. Let's say that I yeah. that we have this thing and we don't know if it's hot or cold. We haven't demonstrated yeah. it to be hot. That doesn't mean it's cold because it could be hot. Just because we haven't demonstrated it to be hot doesn't mean it's not hot. That's what Matt's trying to get at. Ah, uh, it okay, could still yeah. be hot. It may not be cold. <laughs> Right. It may it may yeah. be hot. And just because we haven't demonstrated it as hot doesn't mean it's cold. Ah, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to play it uh, after this episode is over and I will totally get it. But I have another question for next week. Am, am, am Are I, you guys there? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're here. I'm going to I'm trying to find out if I'm on the show next week or not. Or if it's um, Russell. I'm pretty sure I'm not because my family's down. It's Russell, so you, okay. you, you can, can ask and Russell talk and talk host. about yeah. your next question. But no, thank, but I, thank, I will totally get what you're saying after I listen to it. Okay. But I hope thank, so. Thank you again. I love you guys. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks, much. Keith. I, I know it's dead air afterwards, but it's like I was, we were right there. You know what, though? It, it's it, a difficult it, thing to kind of. Keith was an honest caller. Yeah. And that's the thing. Which he, is why he got a round of applause. He's an honest caller. It's one of those things where, and, and by the way, uh, I had this same discussion with Blake Junta, uh, who's a Christian apologist, who uh, is a friend of mine. He's br br very, very bright. And he went with the everything is possible until it's demonstrated to be impossible as well. Uh, simply not the, true. No. Possibility is a claim which has a burden of proof, right. and impossibility is a claim which has a burden of proof. And until one of them is established, the position is, I can't say it's impossible, and I can't say it's possible. Every, every, every claim has a burden of proof like that. And if your position is, hey, it's possible yeah. because it hasn't been shown to be impossible, uh, that's like saying hey, the, the number of blades of grass on the earth is, in fact, either even or odd. Well, and you know, hot and cold wasn't the best example because those are like extremes and there's a big middle ground. Yeah. But possible the, and impossible. Even or, even or odd is yeah. probably the better. So all the blades of grass on Earth, the number is either even or odd. The total number is either even or odd. Is, is it even just because we haven't shown that it's odd? Right. Uh, it's not, by the way. Uh, let's see. We've got Natalia in Asheville. Hey, I love Asheville. Hey. Hey, uh, thanks for waiting. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yay. How's the weather in Asheville? Because okay. it's one of it's like my third favorite town in the United States. Uh, still a little bit chilly, but good. Cool. What do you got for us? Um, so um, I was calling today because I heard that you'd never um, had a definition of spirituality from someone who claims to be spiritual but not religious um, that is consistent. And um, I wanted to provide, like, a sort of all-reaching definition of spirituality because maybe that will may make it easier to discuss with someone. Um, okay. So, um, Although I, I would point out that if their definition is different from yours, you didn't make yeah. it any, easy, any easier for me to have a conversation with them. It certainly be, make it easier to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Um, so... Um, my um, definition of spiritual, or maybe it's easier for, like, someone to think about um, if they're atheists, I don't know, or if they don't believe in super, um, spiritual things, um, not supernatural things, because not. Okay, let me try the definition. Um, so I would say that someone who is seeking spiritual growth is someone who is 
searching for an emotionally satisfying explanation for forces um, that they cannot easily explain. Right. Or not, not um, for invisible forces. Well, wait that a minute, wait them. a minute. Are we talking about a definition of spirituality? Um, or, uh, yes. Okay, because sort of. I don't think that's what you just explained. Um, you started to talk about a person seeking spiritual growth. I'm, I'm asking, but so I need to define well, what are we talking about here? Well, I would define spirituality as the. Um, or someone's spirituality as, um, like, may, uh, I have a hard time explaining this. Um, That's how we normally experience a call yeah. about spirituality. This is, this is why you've heard me say that I have yet to be given a definition of spirituality that makes sense, that ties to something real and demonstrable, it seems to be. It either ties to something real and demonstrable, in which case you should just describe what's actually real and demonstrable, or it doesn't, in which case it, it's incoherent. Well, um, I would, may I should say, mm, spirituality is, um, is, um, is incredibly subjective, which is why it makes yes. it incredibly impossible. It's impossible for someone to describe their own spirituality in a way that makes sense. But even that sentence, when you, when you talk about someone's own spirituality, you have some understanding of what spirituality means. All, all we're all we're asking is, what what does that mean to you? Um, it means, um, yeah, it means an explanation for unexplainable things. <laughs> Spiritu and spirituality is an explanation for unexplainable things. Then they're not unexplainable, yeah. and, and spirituality would have to actually have explanatory power in I order mean, to be that. that. That's a contradiction, and you'd have to define spirituality enough if you wanted it to serve as an explanation for things that we previously thought were unexplained, you would have to first define spirituality and then show how it's an explanation. Well, it's not a um, logical explanation. Well, then why would, general, we, why would we care about it? Well, wait, but if it's, what what kind of explanation is it? It's an emotionally satisfying one. Like uh, when someone says that they believe in like energy fields around someone. So spirituality like no for you. Proof. All right, so for, let me restate then and you tell me if I've got it. You're saying that for you, spirituality means something that makes you feel good about why something happened that you don't understand. Um, yes. But it doesn't help you understand and that, it, and it doesn't really explain it. No, and so it, I'm not sure what it is. It's, it's like you, it's an emotional, it's an emotional reaction that you have to things you don't understand that makes you that is like positive. It's like it helps someone understand the world emotionally. It's I, not. That's why. Okay. Well, here let me maybe like, let me try an example. Okay. So something happens. We just had a caller describing some weird event in a field where people get scratches and they don't know why. All right. So we've got this weird event in the field. Everybody gets scratched. We don't know why. And so you feel good about that situation for some reason, it, because, even though you don't have an explanation. There, it's like you don't have an explanation for it, but you feel good because spirituality. Um, that might not be the best. Like, um, okay, say somebody doesn't have an explanation for death. So, a spirit, like, what happens after death? Because you don't know. Okay. It probably. So, the spiritual explanation for that for one person might be that they go to they go to some form of afterlife where they are where everything is rainbows and sunshine and they're happy and they get to spend time with their loved ones for the rest of eternity and that makes them feel good why is that a spiritual that, explanation is it cause you, because there's no um because it's it's a subjective thing like that's like um so I, I think to myself, after Matt dies, he goes to the Elysian Fields, and then when I die later, I will meet up with Matt and we'll be happy like friends in, in the afterlife. 
And you're saying that's a spiritual explanation, and I'm asking, what, what, why is it not just an explanation? Um, it depends on the person's feeling for about it. So, like, um, like the the only. <laughs> Okay, so here's a question. What if I believe that Matt's going to die and be tortured in hell, and this distresses me because I, don't, I like Matt and I don't want him to be tortured? Would that be a spiritual explanation, even though it causes me emotional distress as opposed to makes me feel better? Yes. Okay, because so it doesn't have to be, reason. is that emotionally satisfying then? Is that what you're calling emotionally satisfying? Because it's an over all worldview that for some reason that emotionally satisfies you and it doesn't necessarily have to be logical it might be because of your upbringing like so you believe that because okay so what you're saying as far as emotionally satis your you're calling emotional satisfaction simply capacity to accept it and have an emotional response to it eases your discomfort with but it wouldn't ease knowing. my discomfort it would make it worse no, it, it eases your discomfort <laughs> with not knowing the answer it doesn't mean okay. the answer is yeah. satisfied okay, okay. Okay. So yes, but the and the answer could also be scientific. Like so, then what you're saying, know, what you're biology. calling the spiritual component. So I have this explanation about hell, and you're saying that spiritual to you just means that there's an emotional component to it. That anything that satisfies me to accept, so that I don't have to say I don't know. Why is that spiritual? Why isn't that just comfortable? Why wouldn't you call that a comfortable, comfortableality? Like. <laughs> Why is it well, spiritual? I'm saying when someone's usually trying to say that they're spiritual, because I wouldn't define myself as spiritual. Um, oh, well. When someone's then trying to say you, that they're spiritual. So wait okay. a minute, wait a minute. So, so you're yeah. answering for people who aren't here. That's yeah. not cool. I, I wouldn't define myself as, as a mystic. <laughs> and so why would I ever try to give a definition of, of what mysticism is? I mean, now, and I, I apologize, but this just seems to be a complete waste of time. Because your definition of spiritual is something subjective that can't be proven that seems to make people emotionally satisfied about blah blah blah. And it's individual to everybody, and, and I don't even consider myself spiritual. Yeah, so... So who are you, whose spirituality are you describing? I, I'd rather hear from people who actually identify <laughs> as spiritual so they can tell me what they mean, rather than somebody who doesn't identify as spiritual telling me... What they think what someone they think else someone means, might. even after saying that it's completely subjected and, and everybody has their own definition. Yeah, and it's, it's just as confusing as before we started. Uh, or as ill-defined. Well, I mean, to say is because it's a subjective subject, it's hard to talk about in long terms. How, how do you I know agree that? it's difficult to talk about. Well, I've had a lot of difficulty talking to people about it, just like during this call. It's worse than that, because there may be a thousand people listening who identify as spiritual who are like, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> right. we, we understand spirituality to mean this. And so I, I, it reminds me, and I, I don't mean this in the offensive way, or, but it reminds me of creationists calling in to talk about biology. I mean, if, if, if this isn't what you are and you don't have a definition that you're, why would we? I, I don't understand how, how, how we're supposed to address this issue of I'm not spiritual, but here's what I think spiritual means. Uh, that's, I'd rather have the spiritual folks address it. Okay, well, thanks for letting me call in. Sure, okay. thanks. Call, call back anytime you want to, I don't know, talk about whatever. Whatever, and, and hopefully maybe something that you have a stake in. Um, uh, Brad in Colorado. Hi, Brad. Can you hear us? Are you there? Hello? It says Brad is on the air. Can you hear me? Hello? Hey, we can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I was just wondering uh, why you uh, don't believe in God. Hello? Yeah. Because we don't see any good reason to believe in God. Okay. Um, well, like, like, how about, like, faith, though? <laughs> how well, about it? <laughs> you know, as far, as, it? as far as I can tell, faith can be used as an apparent justification for anything. Is there any is there any position someone could take and then not say, oh, I just take this on faith? Right, but we, like we all have faith in something. No, so. no, we don't. Not see, this is an equivocation. Um, I have trust and confidence in things, and I apportion my confidence. To, my confidence is proportional to the evidence for it. 
So I don't just have faith that this chair will hold me. I have a confidence level that the chair will hold me based on my understanding of physics and reality in the chair. If, if you want to call that, hang on, hang on. If you want to call that, if you want to call that faith, I, I know that there is a colloquial, hey, you've all got faith. Okay, but that type of faith, if you want to use it that way, is not in any way similar to the type of faith that people are saying they're using to serve as a foundation for their belief in the supernatural or gods, because that is belief in the face uh, without supporting evidence and with evidence uh, in the face of evidence to the contrary. So you don't want to equate those two things. Yeah, I wasn't trying to. I mean, that we all believe in things without evidence. No, that's how, how is it I can just thoroughly explain that I have trust and confidence that is proportional to the evidence, and you can say we all can believe things without the evidence. Okay, so, so what evidence do you have that the, the world's real then? Or what evidence do you have that logic is true? Uh, so you're talking about both the problems of hard solipsism and the foundations of logic. First of all, the logic is a presupposition. The foundations of logic, I presuppose that, as is you know that I'm expanding reality. You can call that a faith-based position. Um, and, and I think you could potentially make an argument for it, but it's a matter of practicality. The, the laws of logic continually demonstrate their usefulness and reliability, and they seem to be true in all possible circumstances, and you would have to assume that they were true in order to try to demonstrate that they weren't. Similarly, I have the direct experience of experiencing a reality, and what you're saying is, how do you know that that's really the real reality? Well, I don't, and I'm not claiming that it is really the real reality. I'm saying I experience a reality, and I have to deal with the reality I experience, within its framework and rules until somebody demonstrates otherwise. It is, to get back to the beginning of the show, for both of these, the null hypothesis. That there is not some greater reality that I'm not experiencing. There's no point to believe that until somebody demonstrates that's the case. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so can we talk about some pieces of evidence then? For evidence for what? Uh, the existence of God. Which God? Um, like just, uh, let's just say like a non-personal God for now and then... I, I don't know what a non-personal God is. Okay, well like a, like a classical uh, deistic God. Sure. Um, well, you, you can talk about it. Here's one of the things. The classical deistic God doesn't uh, manifest in reality in any detectable way, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, so then how could you possibly have evidence for it? Uh, because it could be necessary. How do you demonstrate? Oh, okay, Sorry. you you could you could try to demonstrate that it's necessary, but I thought you were talking about evidence. Yeah, I would say like logical arguments could be considered evidence. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay, so uh, you were talking a bit earlier about um, like possibility and uh, so, like in in terms of the ontological argument, like. That's great timing. I'm which premise. Okay. Just let me, I, I will let you continue, I promise, but it's really good timing because as of today, my entire deconstruction of the ontological arguments is now yeah. available on YouTube. If you Google... Yeah, I just finished watching it. It was oh. interesting. Cool. Uh, so, so how can you demonstrate if something is possible or not? You, you were saying like, the claim something is impossible and needs a burden of proof and the claim that something is impossible. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, maybe I'm, I, I just lost. Okay, possible and impossible both require right. a burden of proof. Sure. How do you demonstrate so, so how, that how something's can... possible? <laughs> I... Yes. So the null hypothesis would be Matt cannot pick up this empty Coke bottle. It, 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 right. So that's a null hypothesis. And if I, my claim is it's possible for me to pick it up, boom, demonstrated the possibility of that. Yeah, if you're watching the show, he just picked I, up I just an picked empty up, Coke maybe. bottle. Awesome. Um, so, but okay. So, I, I want to like let's try to pick an example that's more analogous to to what I'm talking about. So, let's not pick an action, but let's pick an object. So, how would I demonstrate the possibility that an object exists? What object? Well, well I mean, I'm talking about God. I mean, maybe object isn't the right word, but let, like you're, you're asking the wrong exists. people. You're asking me how do I demonstrate that God is possible? Well, when I have no because, reason to because, think that God is possible. And the fact that you can well, identify... I'm trying to say, hey, like... Hang on. The fact okay. that you can pick out something that we have difficulty demonstrating is possible 
is not in any way a response to this issue of possibility and impossibility. It's all about the object that you're picking. Well, yeah, I'm not talking about an action, though. Like, picking up the bottle is like an action. I wasn't talking about an action. I was talking about the object. Okay, but yeah, yeah. So, so, but you don't need to show it's possible that a Coke bottle exists, right? Because it, you, you can just show that it is it does exist. You well, know, you're not that's really, what that, that's the demonstration. Um, when you talk about is it possible for a god to exist, demonstrate that it is in fact possible. Uh, how do I do that? I can, but hold that's on. not my problem. problem. That, that, that's the no, whole. No, Brad, stop! No, not one what? second. Stop. That is my whole point. I say. Demonstrate that it's possible for God exist, and the people who are convinced that a God exists say, how can I do that? I don't know how I could demonstrate. Then why the hell can you possibly believe it? If you have no idea how to demonstrate the possibility of the thing that you think is actually the case, that's your problem, not the problem of the people who aren't believing it. No, I understand. I think we're getting confused here. I'm not saying, like, it's... I'm asking you because I, I think I can, but you, you don't find it very like convincing. So I just want to ask, like, is there a way to show that something possibly exists without demonstrating that it actually does exist? Sure. I think somebody could show that there's a possibility of a certain type of planet with a certain type of atmosphere and to say that it's possible for such a planet to form in so our universe. So how can you make that claim? Because so how, uh, you would use you the information that we have on current planets and you would okay. use the information that we have, I assume, like with gravity and how planets form to say that you could have a planet that has a predominant atmosphere of, you know, whatever, nitrogen or something. Even if we hadn't necessarily found a planet like that, we could say that it, it seems to be something that this universe could actually produce. It doesn't mean that it has produced such a planet. It just means that right. there's no reason to, there, there is no reason to think it's impossible. And based on what we do know, it seems like it is possible. Yeah, this, okay. is, this is how you derive a null Sorry. hypothesis. Essentially, a null hypothesis would be it is not possible for a planet like this to actually exist. And then you use the evidence from what we understand about accretion disks and the formation of planets yeah. to so show here's that how it could happen. The, the, the laws of physics do not render this impossible. As a matter of fact, they may render this likely right. and probable. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I'm talking about. So for okay. God... Nothing about the laws of physics tell us that it's impossible. That's not what I said. That's not what I said either. I said based on what we okay. know, we would have reasons to believe that it actually could happen. Yes. This, we're, okay. we're back to... Not the, just the, that it couldn't. The mere <laughs> fact mean, that we can't show something is impossible doesn't mean it's possible. And if we can't show... I mean, it, yeah, and I, even not being able to show that it's impossible doesn't mean that it's not impossible. <laughs> it's okay, like so maybe I can do be. that then. So let me present another argument to show that it... it what we know about the world seems to lend some credence. And then from there, we can use the modal ontological argument to derive that this being necessarily exists in our world then. Well, no, we actually can't, but go ahead with the first part. Okay. Um, well, I mean, so, okay, so why don't we take a look at the, one of the versions of the cosmological argument. Which version? Um, let's say, like, uh, well, we could say the Kalam, I guess. Okay, what is the conclusion to the Kalam cosmological argument? Um, right. So, well, could, could I talk about, um, like, why I think the conclusion we, from there we can um Can you just answer that? the damn question about what is the conclusion? I know, but you're going to go on about how, okay, all right. Um, the, therefore, the universe had a cause. Cool. What does that have to do with the God at all? Was God in any premise or the conclusion? Uh, no, but... Okay, hello? so now that means that you are using the conclusion from the Kalam as a premise in a different argument, right? No, can I... Do you think I could explain something really quick? I, so I, I don't understand how you could possibly say... And I know you, you've got your hackles up, because I'm cutting you off. But here's the thing. You said, let's start with the Kalam cosmological argument. The Kalam okay. cosmological argument, I have objections to, but the conclusion of it is, therefore, the universe had a cause for its existence. We both agree. Yeah. The Kalam says nothing about God, does not include God or a thinking agent in its premises or its conclusion, correct? Yeah, so okay. it's one part so, of many, so that's why. So I what I'm saying to... is, you wanted to use not the Kalam cosmological argument, but the conclusion of the Kalam as a premise in a new argument for the existence of God, correct? Uh, 
sure. But yes, I, I think that's, that's all I was. That's all I was asking, and you said no oh. reflexively. Okay, because I because then, I, all I'm I, saying, I think you're thinking of the traditional like Kalam, Christ. which I'm not using. So there. Okay, you've got some new version of the Kalam. Does it end with a different freaking conclusion? Well, I, I'm trying to imply things. Okay, like okay. Yeah, let's just say, yeah, so can we agree on the conclusion there, and then we can work from there? I don't know, can you? So I can't actually agree on the conclusion, but the point that I was making is this. <laughs> if you say you want to argue for the existence of God and you want to begin with the Kalam, you can't do that. What you have to do is use the conclusion of the Kalam as a premise in a new argument, because your, new, your argument has to contain something about God, right? Uh... Right, but so I then present God that is... argument, not the Kalam. Okay, well, I, I don't know if I have that worked out in premise form, so that's why. Okay, um... then call us back when you do. Okay. Thanks. Well, I mean, you let lots of people go on and give their arguments, and then, like, I've never. You just I, said I you don't like have it. You, I would have no, be happy I, I to let you continue, argument, but it, you don't have it. It's an in, it's an informal argument. I haven't had idea okay. to put it in premise I, form. I'll tell you what. You got a minute and a half. Go. Okay, so from the conclusion of the Kalam, we can derive that this cause is immaterial, um, powerful, transcendent, etc. And if we can agree on that, and then I would like to move on to like a fine-tuning argument where I can show that this thing is most likely uh, intelligent. No. Nope. So what you're okay. doing is the same thing that William Lane... You're not presenting anything new or novel. This is what William Lane Craig does all the time. Let me present the Kalam, and then from that I'll say, what kind of cause could it be? Ah, well, it needs to be, you know, immaterial and eternal and powerful and an agent and thinking, and none of those things are ever actually demonstrated. And, and the reason is we don't know what could have caused the universe. It's just a, a, a ball of assertions. Uh, well, it would have to be transcendent from the universe, correct? It, it, so if, in fact, the universe had a cause that was external, of course it would have to be external. Okay, and this thing transcendent. would must be immaterial and but timeless. You, right? But we haven't demonstrated that the universe had a cause that was external. All that we all that we demonstrated all, all that we've demonstrated from the Kalam, which by the way is also flawed, is that the universe has a cause. Well, see, you've never let me present the Kalam argument. So my argument isn't the everything okay. begins to exist as a cause. Fine. The, um, go go ahead. You want to put money? Okay. You want to put money on this? Because this that's my new thing. Is I'm willing to put money on this so that when people do exactly what I say they're going to do, after they deny that they're and they claim they're going to do something different, the ACA gets donations from that. Okay. Um, just, what am just I going to do? Just go ahead. Okay. So if the universe began to exist and it had a transcendent cause. The universe began to exist, therefore it had transcendent gods. Uh, I reject the first premise. Okay, so why do you reject the first premise? Because you haven't demonstrated that the universe beginning to exist, and what that actually means with respect to our local presentation it, of the universe. The second premise? Can, your first premise was, if the universe began to exist, it had a transcendent cause for its existence. Yeah, you were talking about the beginning of the universe, right? That's in your first premise. What part? Are you not able to read the words? If the universe began to exist, right? Right, but my second premise is the universe did begin to exist. You would object to the first premise if you were objecting to the causality. Or Brad, the transcendent causality. Brad, your first yes. premise. If the universe yes. began to exist, it had a transcendent cause. That is your first premise. Yes. I'm saying that has not been demonstrated to be the case. That that a if a universe begins to exist, that it necessarily has a transcendent cause. We don't know what type of cause might qualify to start a universe. It could be well, a non-transcendent cause. How did you rule that out? Because everything we know about the world tells us that that's very likely not true. Well, until I mean, can, until can we you give me until a we, example of something that caused itself to exist. No, but I couldn't give you an example of a black swan until we found one either. That's the fallacy you're engaging in. It, it's not. I'm, I'm it trying is. to use our... Okay. See, you can okay. say it's not. I can say it is. Please demonstrate how I know, it's not. <laughs> you cut me off before I could explain why. Okay. Why, 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 why isn't it... Well, you know what? I'm not that concerned about what you think's fair. Okay. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I, I was wondering... So you consider yourself an atheist, correct? I don't just consider myself. I am. Okay. 
Um, so I consider myself happened? devilishly handsome. That may be up for uh, disagreement, but I, I am in fact an atheist. I do not believe that a God exists. Okay, so what evidence do you have for that? I don't have to demonstrate that a God doesn't exist. I'm not claiming that a God doesn't exist or that this is a position. I do not believe that a God exists because there hasn't been sufficient evidence. This is, this is the very first question you asked, which I answered immediately. Um, right, well, that sounds like an agnostic. I mean, but wouldn't you have a burden of proof for your position? What, what is my position? Well, you're an atheist. What, I know. What is my position? Because I'll bet you a dollar you get it wrong. Okay, well, well I, I'm just, I mean, I don't know your... You know, I, I've already you told you personal. twice. That's why I'm willing to bet on it. I've told you twice now. I do not believe that a God exists. Does that okay, mean... So I'm does, gonna read, I'm does gonna read that, the definition does, of atheism that, from... No, you're fucking that. not. <laughs> you're not... Why? Okay. Definition from what? Dic uh, Dictionary.com? No, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So here's the thing. I don't give a rat's ass about what the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says the definition of atheism is. Because dictionaries are not prescriptive. They, don't, they do not tell you what words mean. They describe, they describe they, common usage. Right? Yes. And I just told you what I mean when I say atheist. Okay. So you're, so you're what redefining difference? atheism. No, I'm not, like... redef I'm not redefining atheist. An a atheist is somebody who believes that a god exists, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And an atheist is somebody who does not believe that a God exists, right? An atheist is someone who does not believe. It. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. there you go. All right, that's, that sounds good. Um, Agnosticism and Gnosticism don't address belief, do they? Uh... Well, I mean, it depends. Right? No, I they they address not they address knowledge. It's right there in the. But why in the do you name. get to define the words however you want, and then when I try to say, well, not necessarily, and then you say, well, no. I'm I mean, telling you how I use them. I'm also telling you what the common usage is. Okay. You, could you be an agnostic theist, someone who believes that because knowledge is a subset of belief, right? <laughs> oh sure. Why why are you laughing and saying oh sure? It is knowledge is a subset of belief, right? Yes. Okay. And therefore, if theism and atheism address belief, and Gnosticism and agnosticism address knowledge, then those become a subset of the belief, right? Okay, so I just have a question then. What would you call someone who neither believes that God exists or that God does not exist? Non-existent. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Phrase that again, because you, you did something. You said that there's somebody who doesn't believe God exists and doesn't believe God doesn't exist. Right? Yeah, they just they, As they soon just as they don't believe God, you are, you've already changed the usage. Theists believe God exists. Atheists do not believe God exists. This is not the same as believing God doesn't exist. It is these right. people are unconvinced that a God exists. How about someone who holds no belief at all? There is no such thing. Well, no, but if somebody doesn't believe a God exists, they're the non-theist. They're the atheist. They're an atheist. There's, there's no middle ground between I believe and I do not believe. Right? Those are the only two possibilities. You accept it as true or you have not right, yet Right, but that doesn't mean you have to true. accept either one. No, right. Yes, no, it does. Well, <laughs> it's, so here's the thing. Here, let me stop, stop, stop. About. This is really easy. A, a or not A, those are the only two possibilities, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. I believe and I do not believe. Those are the only two possibilities, right? Yes. Okay. What's, that doesn't mean you have to hold one of those, though. What is, if you just acknowledge that those are the only two possibilities, that everything either believes or does not believe, what's the other option? You are no, violating the I, law. I, did, I didn't say every, I, hold on, no, 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 no. I, I didn't say everyone either believes or not believes. I said that there's two possibilities. That doesn't mean every single person has to hold to one of those two possibilities. Brad, you are not even listening. Okay. L listen. I believe or I do not believe. Those are the only two possibilities, correct? Um, it's a direct logical, logical negation. It is A and not A. I believe, I do not believe. Okay, yeah. Those are the only two possibilities, right? It, yeah, if you're, okay. if you're holding hey. a belief. Yeah. No, they're not, they are the only two possibilities. There's no not holding there a belief. Are, it, what Matt is saying is there are the people that believe it, and then there's everyone else. And those, everyone else is people who don't oh, okay. believe it. So you're either among the people who believe it, or you're among the people who are okay, not so, the people so, that believe it. It seems a bit absurd then, because wouldn't that, like, I mean, 
I mean, I don't know. A house would be an atheist then because a house does not. No, hold because that's not that a that a house is not doesn't have the capacity for belief. What we're talking about well, now here. You see, now you're defining atheism no, even further. No, because if I use the word bald, what you're saying is, oh, well, a rock is bald. No, because bald applies to things which should or could have hair, and so you wouldn't call a house bald just because it doesn't have hair, because you're using bald to apply to things that. That can have that have a capacity for hair. This so when we're talking about theory. beliefs, right? We all understand that what we're, ta I, I what we're talking that, about are the way. things that have the capacity for beliefs. You disagree with what? So um, the definition of bald is having a scalp wholly, and the definition of scalp is the skin covering the head. So a rock doesn't have skin covering the head. Okay. So. We have like there's bald animals, you know, that, <laughs> I mean, you could be bald, there's a dog could be bald on its butt. Right, and I would call a dog bald. <laughs> but it's not, it's not, not bald, right. it doesn't have hair on its, it could have hair on its skull, but not on but its But however, animals. however you define bald, everything is either bald or not bald, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. But I'm just saying, like, everything, I mean, everything, my everything my either believes naked. or does not believe, correct? Right, so the right. pen I'm holding right now is an atheist. No, the pen you're holding now does not believe. Atheist is a thinking agent who could potentially believe that does not believe. Okay. It's basic okay. So set theory. It's before, basic so set theory. We just never got past the first damn thing. Can I plug Austin Klein's yeah. uh, about .com, atheism, agnosticism, about .com website? He has some really good articles on the definitions of atheism going back to the 1800s all the way through different sources so that people can see how varied and broad the definition of atheism is and has been for centuries. And the big thing is, as I pointed out in another video, I don't care what label you put on it. We need to be talking about the concept. So there's, there's a claim. Some God exists. Everyone either accepts that claim or they don't. There's another claim. No God exists. Everyone either accepts that claim or they don't. What you're trying to do is say that atheists accept the second claim. And what I'm pointing out is that they reject the first claim. The null hypothesis is that no God exists until such God has been demonstrated. The default position is rejection and disbelief of a claim until it has met its burden of proof. It is not a responsibility of atheists who are rejecting the claim that a God exists to then prove that God doesn't exist. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, do you want to move on to other callers or can I ask another question? I'll, I'll let you ask another question. I mean, maybe it might be too big to get into, but if um, it is, we'll so move what's on. your, uh, what's your, like, re, like, do you think the fine-tuning argument is one that holds any weight? Like, I feel like it would hold at least some, um, like, Why? even, like, in a Bayesian sense. Okay, so. Because it's more likely, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go finish. Um, well, yeah, I think it's more likely under theism that we would see the various, um, fine-tuning of constants. Yeah, Blake and I had this conversation. In order, in order to determine that something is more likely given X, you have to have some understanding of whether or not X is possible, whether or not X is probable, in order to compare how right. likely it is as an explanation of something else. If we have no demonstration that theism is possible or probable, then how can you say it's the best explanation? Well, because if the, the, the various... Um margins um, for the fine-tuning contents are very small and not like extraordinary as we see them that could be considered uh, I mean if uh, that were this true, is this is an argument, argument would be weak. So, no this is an argument that the fine-tuning of the, the apparent fine-tuning of the universe seems so unlikely therefore we are justified in leaping to a supernatural explanation with no demonstration that it's possible or probable this is, I've already, you know, when I did my video on fine tuning, uh, I can deal cards out and you'll get all 13 spades. That's incredibly unlikely. It's a perfect bridge hand. We know it has happened in bridge tournaments at least once, I believe, um, even though there have not been enough hands of bridge played to exhaust all possible combinations. Yeah. So if I dealt you 13 spades, and we talked about this yesterday, is it more likely that it was an honest deal or that I cheated? or that God gave you 13 spades? Um, 
Well, I guess it would depend on your prior credence for the likelihood that a god exists, I guess, and, and the various conditions around that dealing. Okay. How do you determine how likely it is that a god is going to give you 13 spades? Well, I guess that would be based on the other... Go away. Um, I guess that would be based on the, the other um, various evidences for God. Um, I, I'm yeah. still waiting on any evidences for God. What I, what I keep getting is arguments and fallacious appeals that something is so improbable that therefore we're justified in thinking that a God exists. That's, well, that's simply not true. More, I mean, it's not an absolute knockdown argument, but I think we, we uh, should admit on some level that it does have some... Um, makes God light slightly more likely. How, how can it make something like a God more likely? Well, because it, the likelihood under atheism is just, or, or no God, is just so small that, I mean, I don't really see Really? It. Okay, so what other universes do you have to investigate? How do you know that this isn't the only possible way that a universe could have formed? Right. So, well, what we know about these constants is that they're, they're not that way for any, like, they're not fixed. There's a whole batch of arguments of why they're not fixed, but they could right. easily be another way. Um, everything we know about physics tells us that there's nothing necessary about these laws instead of another set of laws. Well, see, I, I find this incredibly problematic because we have exactly one universe to investigate, right? We know how things are. Okay, but there are certain constants that we can look at and see, well, okay, this one actually, you know, the likelihood of it being like this is actually quite high because there's not a lot of other options. Well, um, but for some of them, you can there, look at there well, there's some no that, reason at all. So there may be some that this is the only option for that factor. Oh, well, yeah. Or, or, how, do yeah we, sure. how can we determine that it's not the case for all of them? Okay, because it's just, it's not, it's, okay, so the conditions under that one that make it likely aren't there for the other one. I don't know how you I mean, can, I, I can, uh, first of, so first of all, you're not answering the question, but I don't know how you can talk about likely. How many universes do we know of? Okay, so I, I think the huge problem here is, I, I guess you're a frequent wit, frequentist, I mean. I think I, the huge I, problem I here is that you can't address a question without trying to put, to label it. Well, because all, there's a all I asked, different. All I asked was how many universes we have. Right, because you're okay, but I know where you're okay. So, so as far as we know, um, one. You know what, Brad? I'm done, uh, because all I okay. asked was how Thank many you. universes we have, and your answer, as far as we know, one. Why would we talk about universes that we don't know about? I asked what what, what the actuality was, and you can't even just say one. Well, I mean, I okay, but I don't have infinite knowledge, right? So I. The question was, how many universes do we know about? Not how many universes actually exist, or how many universes, universe, how many universes or how many, exist. you're done, you're done, you're done, no, 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 you're done. The question was not, how many universes does an infinitely knowledge to being know about? It was, how many universes do we know about? It's not a trick question, it's one. Now, Douglas Adams gave a really great response to this idea of the anthropic principle and fine-tuning, that if a, you know, a puddle uh, gain consciousness and looked around it would find hey look at this hole it's perfectly shaped to me right a complete inversion that the pot the water fit what the hole was similarly when we talk about these things people say oh it's amazing that the universe system just seems so fine-tuned for us well first of all all the best evidence points to the fact that we evolved to fit the universe that we find ourselves in additionally Hawking has pointed out that if the universe is fine-tuned for anything, it seems to be fine-tuned for the creation of black holes, which is antithetical to life. And we know that the vast majority of the universe is also antithetical to life. That there are the building blocks of life all over the place, but, you know, if I just stick you, I don't even have to stick you out in space, I can just hold you underwater for a while. The idea, oh, oh, look, it all comes together just for us, is so monumentally arrogant. But then to say, I just can't imagine how this could have happened, unless there was a creator, and that makes a creator likely, is fallacious, no matter how unlikely it is. You need to demonstrate that it's actually impossible in order to say that a creation is, uh, that a creator is necessary. You don't get to necessity by saying, oh, this is unlikely. You get to necessity, which is an absolute, by showing that the alternative is in fact impossible. And if all your argument is, is that it's unlikely, therefore that raises the probability of God, you are wrong.
demonstrably, fallaciously wrong. Does it raise the possibility? Does it, would it also raise the possibility of universe creating pixies? Wouldn't it raise the possibility of any other explanation that is sufficient to explain this? This is the problem when you say, oh, of course it seems like God is the answer because you have invented a panacea. You have a being that can do anything and therefore it will be a sufficient explanation for anything, but it will never be a necessary explanation until you demonstrate it. So when you say, ah, in a completely abstract, you know, epistem or not in a, in, a, in a philosophical context, is it possible for an all-powerful being to create a universe? Of course. <laughs> You've defined a being that can do this. I, it's, it's uh, incredibly frustrating to just, how many universes do we have? How many universes do we know about? One. That's, I mean, I stole that straight from you. I don't know why I didn't just shut up and let you, you do it. Uh, we are running up on time. There's like five minutes or so left. And as a reminder, we go to dinner after the show, and I haven't talked about it. We will be eating at Star of India. And I'll put the address up, 2900 West Anderson Lane, right there. I don't know. I, I, I rambled at, at the end of that. I didn't know if you had anything to add. No, nah, I think it's covered. Who do we want? Who are we going to... Got a couple options there. Well, we'll go with we'll go with Ram since he's calling from New Delhi, India. Hopefully, we can hear him. Hi, Ram. Hi. Hey. Hi. Clear as a bell. Yep. Perfect. Thanks for waiting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so last I, I called uh, some time back. Uh, maybe you guys remember. You don't. Uh, I had something to discuss that uh, you know there is a possibility that things exist uh, that they are there, but they're not tangible. So something like mathematics. Mathematics is real, right? Well, I wouldn't say that mathematics exists. When we're talking about existing, we tend to be yeah, talking exactly, about exactly, things. exactly. So now, now I say that mathematics exists. Doesn't it exist? Well, at, mathematics is an abstract concept that is contingent yes. upon brains. So it doesn't exist as a thing unto itself. No, no, no. It's not. It's not contingent upon brains. It's an abstract. It's an abstract concept. It's the study. How of do you how do you have a concept systems. without a brain? How do you have a concept without a brain? Uh, computers exist, right? Con computers conceptualize? They, they, they grasp and understand mathematics? They f work on the basis of mathematics. Sure. To the extent that you're, so you're going to say it, that... It exists, it's not a brain. It's not a brain and it exists uh, out of uh, uh, reality. So, so, so you're saying that mathematics as a concept exists in a computer? Yes. It, it works on the basis of mathematics. And it's now, real. Saying a, can... saying a computer works because of mathematics is separate from saying that a computer has the concept of mathematics. Does an abacus have the concept of mathematics? Okay. Now we're talking about whether something has a con concept of mathematics right, or not. Right, right. That's what he was asking. So I'm, my, 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 my core argument is different. My core argument is something like mathematics exists. I, I don't so accept that mathematics. You have to define what you mean by mathematics exists. If, if you removed every thinking being from the universe, would mathematics mm -hmm. still exist? Not, not quantities, not potentially measurable facts about the universe. If you removed every mind from the universe, would mathematics uh -huh. still exist? Okay, now this is, okay. Okay, uh, that, that's a very difficult question again. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know I either. Don't know. And on that note, because we're running out of time, think about it some more. Give us a call back. There's one guy, more guy who's been waiting since the pre-show I want to get to, and that's uh, Jean in, in Netherlands. Thanks for waiting for the whole show to get to be last. No worries. Wait to the last show as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew you I didn't did. get on last show, which is why I wanted to make sure you got on last here. Yeah, I, I don't think I can make my whole argument. I think I'll have to call back in, in two weeks. I can't make it next week, I'm afraid. Can we go long? We, we, can, we can go we'll a go little go bit long longer. for you. Because you've been patient. Oh, all right. Well, that's great. Thank you. Well, sure. um, and hi, Tracy, by the way, as well. Hey. I know the co-host is often forgotten, and I didn't want you to be forgotten. Okay. I, I'll tell you this. The co-host isn't forgotten. One of the things, in, I'll say this real quick. As I travel around doing lectures and debates, without fail, countless people come up uh, to say thank you for the show. And... I, you know, I also point out that it's not my show. I, I just one of the people who talk, and without fail, there, you know, thanks to Tracy and you know, 
Jan and Russell oh. and Don and everybody else. But a recent one came in to especially thank the guys in the booth over there who ha are continually fixing the technical issues and make the show better. Uh, Which I, just I, wanted to th I wanted to thank those as well because I'm assuming uh, th these are the kind of people that arranged uh, the Lin phone service that I'm using to call you. Yes. <laughs> All right, Which so what have you great. got for us? So, uh, first a little uh, prelude. Uh, I live in the Netherlands where atheism is basically the default. Uh, I live in our own Bible Belt, but still I can have a conversation with almost anyone about atheism without getting it into any trouble. Um, so I was happy living this way, basically an atheist all my life, and I've never had any conflict until uh, uh, a year ago I had an encounter with a theist um, who basically changed that. And she, she was un completely unreasonable. She fit all the stereotypes that you know. And so I started to become a bit more vocal about my atheism, as it were. Mm -hmm. And that was just fine. And then a, few, a month ago, I had this exchange on Facebook uh, on a post by The Daily Show and this post was by a Trump supporter. And he was basically saying that uh, Trump was chosen by God to bring stability to the world. And that if we knew end time prophecies, we would know that Trump was the bringer of, of, of good. And basically, I just couldn't believe what he was saying. <laughs> I'd never encountered <laughs> anything like this. And, and I know you guys get this kind of stuff more often, but to so, me, this was very new. So I'm... We're, we're having a bit of a problem with the phones. You're starting to cut out a little bit. Um, but I think I, we heard the point. Yeah, what I, what I will say is that while we're... While we're, <laughs> uh -oh. while, while we're not going to be coming on Trump specifically, is somebody in the bathroom? No, 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 it's not about Trump. It's not about Trump at all. It's it's just yeah. the uh, how we how this conversation got started. Um, this uh, So... I basically said, you actually believe this stuff, don't you? I couldn't believe it. And I said, you talk about truths, but you can't prove any of this in any scientific way. To which he said, yes, I can prove it, which, you know, that'll be the day. I want to see that. So I challenged him, and he started with some biblical numerology, and which I basically called him out on and then he wouldn't uh, continue it anymore because he knew he was called out so he continued this conversation and eventually he basically claimed he was he basically joyfully looked started looking forward to a time when the the church would take over the world and get rid of everything and everyone that felt differently than he did ah, you've met a dominionist <laughs> well uh, you can call it that. Um, uh, a friend and uh, a friend of mine, uh, which I discussed this with later, uh, we dubbed it crisis, as in Christian ISIS. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's that's going to be a meme by tomorrow, by, yeah. by in 20 minutes, <laughs> actually. H-R, capital I-S-I-S. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, great. It, but, and after I pointed this out to him, he just started quoting Bible verses and showing what a zealot he truly was. He just kept digging his hole further. And then the most interesting point of the whole conversation was that I just said, you know you're just digging your hole further. You're just confirming what we're saying here. Yeah. And then he said, I'm not digging a hole. I'm heaven bound. Okay. Maybe and, that's the fastest way to heaven is to start digging a hole. <laughs> well, well, to which I responded, that's the same thing a suicide bomber thinks before hitting the trigger. Yeah. Exactly. On that note, we got to we got to call it quits. In his I, defense. Oh, yeah. I, I I appreciate you waiting. Uh, we got to call it quits today. Thanks for waiting through the whole show, and please call us back. No worries. Time. But Thank you. Uh, maybe in four years I can join you for dinner. Ah, okay. that'd be awesome. We, we may or may not be at Star of India, but we'll be there, <laughs> be there today shortly. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks to all the studio audience and for clapping politely for.
gentleman changed his mind. And for all the folks in the booth who make this real, I won't be here next week. Russell will be here alongside uh, somebody. Uh, you can go to atheist-experience.com for more information. You can email tv at atheist-community.org uh, to contact us. We get more email than we can address. So don't feel bad if you don't get a response quickly or perhaps at all. But we do try to read all of them. And uh, that's it for today. All right. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.